Breitling was kind of a big deal in the 50s. See, they just conquered the skies with the Navi timer and the chronomat, and they were turning their attention to the oceans. But they were playing from behind because we'd already gotten the likes of the Rolex Submariner, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, and in order to catch up, Breitling had to innovate. And so what they came up with was the Super Ocean line of watches, one of which was called the Slow Motion. It's called that because it's a diving chronograph, meaning a chronograph that can go 200 meters below the surface. And it had a chrono hand that rotated once every 60 minutes instead of 60 seconds, because that makes more sense for divers. Hey guys, I'm Max and welcome back to Watch Crunch. So first an announcement, we are bringing on board a new creator. His name is Joshua. Josh, come over here. Tell the people a little bit about yourself. What is up watch fam? My name is Joshua, like Max said. I've been obsessed with watches for way too long. I have a background in design and marketing and I'm very excited to be a part of the team. Welcome on board. Thank you sir, thank you sir. So you're gonna see this guy sometimes in front of the camera, sometimes behind the camera, but he's also really into short form content so he's gonna be running our Watch Crunch TikTok channel. So check that out, brand new. He's got some hot takes. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Likewise. Okay, get out of here. Let's talk about Breitling. Breitling is an important name in the watch world, but I feel like they kind of lost their way over the past few decades. However, ever since George Kern took over in 2017, they've steered the ship back on course. And they've been busy revamping the Navi timer, the chronomat, and now they've turned their attention to the super ocean. And each time it's been really nice to see them dive into their back catalogs for inspiration, dropping watches with plenty of vintage cues, many at more risk-friendly sizes. There's a lot to love about the new Super Ocean, which comes in a variety of sizes from 36 to 46 and a selection of fun colors. This one, the Kelly Slater edition, is a bright orange that really pops on the wrist. The dial layout is interesting and reminiscent of dive watches from over a half century ago. A large silver chapter ring frames a smaller inner dial. That inner dial houses square hour markers, which are polished and applied. And in keeping with the square theme, an oversized one adorns the minute hand, which recalls the minute counter on the slow motion vintage chronograph. A pop of green is found on the lollipop of the second hand. When you hold this watch, you just get the sense that it's extremely well constructed with tight tolerances and premium materials. For example, the tactility of the 120 click ceramic bezel, it's smooth and pleasant. The case is mostly brushed with polished bevels running along the flanks for good measure. A oversized crown is signed with a Breitling B and screwed down for a robust 300 meters of water resistance. Now you might say this is a good competitor to the Ceramic Submariner on paper. This watch is 42 millimeters, which sounds big, but actually wears well thanks to a compact lug to lug of 47 and a half and a thickness of just 12 and a half. Some models come on Breitling signature slanted link bracelets, but this one is on rubber with a solid milled clasp. So the original Super Ocean was supposed to compete with the Rolex sub, but history has clearly declared the winner in that matchup. But the question is, with the new Super Ocean, did Breitling put itself back into the ring? I think there are two ways to look at this. Priced around four and a half thousand, it's half the price of a sub and much more in line with like a Tudor. Hell, it's even got the square markers like the Pelagos. And with all the variety that Breitling has brought with this model, you can argue that it's actually more fun than a Rolex. But fun alone doesn't cut it at this price. You kind of have to be firing on all cylinders to justify a price tag of near 5,000. And that's when I have to take my rose colored glasses off and look at this watch more objectively. But first guys, do me a solid, drop a like for this video. And in return, I'm gonna drop a big truth bomb. So. The truth is I can't in my good conscience recommend this watch. There are two big problems and they're both related to the movement. So hear me out. First, they style this watch after a diving chronograph, but they gave us a simple three-hander. 
It's kind of like they found some great inspiration in the vintage slow motion, only to throw in the towel halfway and never gave it the full send. And so what we get is this like, bastard stepchild with elements like the big square minute hand that I sometimes mistaken as the hour hand because the hour hand's usually bigger. And that square is supposed to be the minute counter on the chronograph, but instead it just lazily drags his fat ass around the dial, seemingly oblivious to its birthright. How cool would it have been if Breitling had brought back a modern version of the slow motion chronograph? I mean, I think that would have been an instant classic. And it's not like Breitling isn't good at chronograph. This is the company that claims to have invented the first mono pusher chrono in 1915. Hell, they even lent Tudor their B01 movement. I mean, how hard would it have been for them to modify it to run a slow minute hand? And that gets us to the second problem. Let's say, it was too much work to recreate a slow motion diving chronograph. But why did they choose to stick an ETA 2824 in the new Super Ocean? There's nothing wrong with an ETA off the shelf movement, but you can only say that to about the $2,000 tier. Anything above that, it just seems inappropriate. I mean, even Longines, Tissot can get like 70, 80 hours of power out of their modified ETA movements. So this one really perplexes me because it's not like Breitling doesn't have the movement that Tudor traded back. The Kinesi one that is four Hertz, cost certified and runs 70 hours of power. So why downgrade to the ETA in the new watch? It seems like Breitling tried to make a Tudor. I mean, like half the price of a Rolex with a heavy dose of vintage inspiration, but they failed at even that. So guys, I'm not gonna keep ranting. I don't like to make negative reviews. Most of the time, if I get a watch I don't like, I just don't make content with it. The thing is, I do like this watch. It's well-made, it's fun, if it's superbly on the wrist for its size. It's also pretty. They dare to completely change the design, but it feels like Breitling didn't follow through and really miss an opportunity. So that's my hot take. You can come roast me on watchcrunch.com. I'll put a link to a longer discussion in the pinned comments below. As always, stay crunchy. I'll see you in the next one.